All right, if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, and let's look at verse 1. We're going to try to look at the whole chapter if possible. There's a lot here to share, but it's beautiful because the Apostle Paul, as we saw last week, he said an apostle by the will of God, and we did some background into who this Apostle Paul was before Christ. We saw that he was Saul of Tarsus, a self-righteous Pharisee who persecuted the church of God, who hated Jesus, an enemy of Christ, responsible for blood on his hands, and we left off on his conversion. I can't, it's not said there in Acts chapter 9, but I can't imagine the Apostle Paul believing that he was correct and right on his way to persecute Christians, hating their God, Jesus, and being knocked off his horse, not by an overbearing God who's ready to judge him, but a loving God who is there to forgive him for the blood of his own children on the Apostle Paul's hands. Whom are you, Lord, said the Apostle Paul. I am Jesus. Oh, the Apostle Paul must have thought, oh, he's real, and I've been hurting him, I've been on the wrong side, I've been persecuting him. He says, whom you have been persecuting. I've been hurting you, Lord. And yet, Paul, the Lord would say, not written, but we know, because he's about to write a lot about the grace and the love of God. I love you, I died for you, and I'll forgive you of all your sin. And the Apostle Paul responds is, what do you want me to do? He said, right now, just go and pray, and I'll show you what you must do. And we left off with Ananias goes, hearing from the Lord to Paul, and the Lord says, go and talk to this Saul and pray for him. And Ananias is scared of Saul of Tarsus because he's a bad guy. He kills us. He puts us in jail. He murdered or helped murder the Christians. And the Lord says he's praying almost as proof. He's a changed man. His heart is different. He prays for him. Scales kind of fall off of his eyes. He receives this sight, but not 100%. And this Saul of Tarsus becomes the Apostle Paul. He spends 13 years in the desert. He doesn't just go out right away. Studying, praying, looking at the Word of God. And then he goes on these three missionary journeys. He's responsible for writing most of the New Testament. He is killed, I believe, stoned to death because he has a vision of heaven he doesn't know if he's alive or not. And he does these three missionary journeys where he eventually gets arrested once and then sadly a second time. And from jail, he begins to write these letters to encourage the new converts who become the church. And these converts are in specific locations at this time. One of these are in a place called Ephesus. They're in modern day Turkey. The church of the Ephesians and the Apostle Paul begins to write to them. Remember he wrote Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints or the believers who are in Ephesus. And the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we read Ephesians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, it's like one continuance, ramble, or thought in a sense. And the only explanation I have is that he, he, as he's writing, he is in a sense even maybe worshiping and rambling. If you've been in prayer and you begin to pray to the Lord, and, and you're, you're talking about something, you're talking about how worthy and beautiful he is, but then you kind of go to the side and spontaneously, without um, planning, and just begin to say, you're a holy, you're a good, you're just, and you begin to worship Him. 
And it almost seems like that's what the Apostle Paul is doing off and on. And yet there is a structure to this letter. We're going to look at the work of God. We're going to look at the work of His Son Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit here in chapter 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, just to be clear, literally one of the twelve apostles of Christ. I know there's some churches who teach that there are apostles and wrongly put authority on these men as they hear from God and speak to the people. And the ones who are off are the guys who wear it as a badge and say, I'm apostle so and so, like, you're somebody, you're nobody. And, and they think they're like the, the 12 apostles. They're no one's like the 12 apostles anymore. There is the apostles literally in the sense of the sent out ones, sort of like a missionary. But those people biblically are humble and they're not looking for glory or power or titles. Um, I met an apostle in downtown Los Angeles and probably the, the, the best example that I could see biblically of a modern apostle. No title, no grandeur, no pomp, no pride. This man was sleeping on the street. And we, we went to give him a flyer to invite him to church late at night. And we, you know, he woke up and he's like, I'm not homeless. <laughs> well, you look homeless. And he was, you know, he was he, he was in his right mind and everything. And he's like, I've been sent here from whatever, you know, state back east, and I'm here just until the Lord um, and he wasn't on drugs, he was rational. We were with him for a while. He's like, I, I, I'm here leading people to the Lord until he tells me to go back home. Literally a sent out one. He came to church with us. He prayed. He was awesome. He was awesome. And then we never, ever saw him again. Beautiful man of God. Someone who sent out. Paul says to the saints who are in Ephesus, and here literally to the believers in there's a lot of stuff behind it, this book that you know scholars begin to write. Was it directed to the saints? Was it a circular letter for the church? I don't know. We'll let them argue about that. But his saying is, grace and peace from God our Father. And it's been said before by others, before you know the peace of God or have peace with God, you must first know the grace of God. Who wrote this? The Apostle Paul. Did he have peace with God? No, not at all. He literally was the enemy of God. He thought he served God. He thought he was right with God, but literally he was an enemy of Jesus Christ. He had no peace with God until what? He received that unmerited grace from God. And grace, we know, is that which you don't deserve. What did Saul of Tarsus deserve? Probably death. Probably, you know, pop his brain or pop his heart or make his eyeballs, you know, crack him like eggs and run down his face or something, right? You know, you killed my children. You did this or you did that. And yet, the Lord didn't give him justice. He didn't just show him mercy. He showed him grace. That which he didn't deserve. Forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and this call that he receives to become an apostle of the Lord. So he writes, grace and peace from God our Father. I'm one of you now. He's our Father. In verse 3 through 6, we see the work of of God the Father as he begins to write. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us from the, begin from the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise 
of the glory of His grace by which He has made us accepted in the Beloved. Now there's a lot there, but He starts with, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He starts up by worshiping and blessing God the Father and pointing to Jesus. Paul called for blessing upon the Father in the sense of recognizing His glory, honoring goodness, because the Father has already blessed the believer with every spiritual blessing. Notice he says, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now this letter is a letter, like remember we talked about last week, who are you? And I began to say, the book of the Ephesians begins to explain who you are. Here the Apostle Paul is sharing truths with you that you are blessed, that you are a child of the living God. In the world, right here on earth, people live with the hope that one day I will get to heaven. Well, the book of Ephesians and Paul reminds you that you're already going. <clears throat> and because you're already going, you're blessed. People go to church, they go to religion, they may come to a Bible study or whatever, do certain things in life to try to gain favor and end up hopefully one day I'll make it to heaven. And I've heard people say, you know, and it can sound presumptuous. Wow, who are you to say you're going to heaven? Well, biblically speaking, if you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've asked Him to forgive you of your sins, then the Bible says you are forgiven and you are saved and you are going. And because of that, you are blessed. Notice he says, who has blessed us? That's in the past tense. You're already blessed. People are looking for financial blessings. Bless me, bless me. Well, there's nothing I can do for you. Pray to Jesus. He'll bless you. You notice, who has blessed you. This blessing is ours. God's resources are there for us always. This speaks of an attitude of certainty and assurance. So this morning, if you walk away with nothing, I want you to know that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you follow Him, you're not perfect, you're still a sinner, but you're a forgiven sinner, then you can have the assurance that you are blessed. We are not sitting here or groaning and crying or fretting or worrying and questioning our own salvation. He has blessed us and therefore he, we will bless Him. If you think little of what God has done for you, you will do very little for Him. But if you have a great notion of His great mercy to you, you will be greatly grateful and gracious to Him. And a man by the name of Spurgeon wrote that, and it's true. Jesus said, He who is forgiven much, loves much. When you understand that you are a sinner, and that's a good thing to, to, to see yourself that way, and you need a Savior, and God comes to you and He presents His love and His forgiveness to you, then something happens. A gratitude naturally will overwhelm through your life. Lord, like the Apostle Paul says, my life is yours. What do you want me to do? And that's why we're here. God somewhere somehow touched our lives. We're not perfect. We're not good. We all have problems. Everybody has their vices or, or, or quirks or things that we wish we would be better, but we're forgiven. And because of that, we have a gratitude. And when you have a gratitude towards God, you want to give to Him. You want to serve Him. You want to be used by Him. He has blessed us, so we bless Him. Right? And that's how it should be. The Pharisees, when they came to give, one would say, I, I fast, I tithe, I pray, and thank God I'm not like this sinner right here. And, as, and the Lord said He was praying to himself. 
God didn't even hear him. But there was another man who came into the temple. He wouldn't even so much as look up into heaven. And he would beat his heart and he said, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Lord uses that man as an example to say, he went away justified by God, forgiven, justified. When you're blessed by God, then you will bless the Lord. As the Apostle Paul writes, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he speaks, who has blessed us, no longer just speaking to the Jews. You see, the oracles of God, the teachings of God, the prophets of God were instructed to mainly only go to the Jewish people for thousands of years. Even at the time of Jesus, he was instructed or instructed his disciples to not go the way of the Samaritans yet. To the Jew first. Now, through the Apostle Paul, God begins to share his truth with the non Jew. The Gentiles, thank you, Lord. And I think we've gone as far west over the last 2,000 years, missionaries, as we can go because we're testament to their teaching, their preaching, their ministries over the last 2,000 years. We're here on in California, beautiful California, not far from the Pacific Ocean, where I don't think you can go any more west without, before you go east, and the gospel has reached the Gentile world. Thank God, he says to us, which includes Jews and Gentiles. Notice he says, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, try not to look at money or to grow an extra five inches tall as a blessing or maybe grow your hair back or, you know, these you know, things that we look at as blessings. Um, but notice, this morning we're going to talk about blessings. The Apostle Paul says, you're blessed with every spiritual blessing where? In the heavenly places and in Christ Jesus. And you're going to see in Christ a lot. You can follow Him. You can believe in Him. But are you in Christ? You can know of Him. Are you in Him as He in you? And there's a huge difference. A lot of people go to church and they know about Him, they heard about Him, but are you actually in Him? And if you are, He says, He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This describes both the kind of blessing and the location of those blessings. These are the spiritual blessings which are far better than material blessings. These blessings are ours in the heavenly places in Christ. They are higher, better, and more secure than earthly blessings. And we all know money comes and the money goes. A car is brand new and then it gets hit, it's total, it's junk, or it gets old. Right? Houses come, houses go. I get to teach the elderly um, Tuesdays, thank God, have been doing it, and it's a blessing. But I know they've all had wealth, and now it's gone because they're in an assisted living type situation where they had to sell it all or give it all away to be taken care of. And, you know, they're not looking for that material blessing anymore. As you mature in the Lord, you're going to realize that material blessings are shallow. Yeah, they come and they go, and that's just part of life. And there's principles that you can do to, to, to make money. And, and, and Jesus says, don't put your treasure here on earth where moth will destroy and rust and thieves break in to steal. But put your treasure in heaven. Put your eyes on the Lord. And I think in these days that the economies will go up and down. That terror attacks will happen. You know, natural disasters are happening on the east coast. But what about if they happen on the west coast? If something heavy happens here, there's no more economy. There's no more place. No one's going to be open for work. Everyone's, you know, going to just be trying to eat. And that's when you mature as a Christian and you begin to look at your spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Notice, 
Our thanks are due to God for all temporal blessings. They are more than we deserve, but our thanks ought to go to God in thunderous of hallelujahs for spiritual blessings. A new heart is better than a new coat. I love that. As a pastor, and being on social media, you get a lot of weird requests. And, and one of them, I guess something that's popped, it's probably been around for years, but it's new to me, is people, especially now with the new year, are looking for life coaches, right? <laughs> and, and basically, it's motivation. It's you can do it, and, and, and this, and that. And what happens is people get tired, and, and they're sick and tired of themselves. <laughs> no real change. They've made their money. Um, they have their things, but they're still messed up inside. And I want to tell them, there's nothing I can do for you. <laughs> the best thing I can do is point you to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is better than what? A new coat. You can change the outside all you want. You can work out, you can eat right, and we should. But who are you inside? And if you have a new heart, which I know all of you do because I know you. You guys are, are good. You are godly. You are spiritual. Except, no, I'm just kidding, brother. <laughs> Except for that guy back there. Um, but I know who I used to be. I know my heart. I know that can still be there. But I have a new heart. You have a new heart. Hopefully your, your wife or your husband sees that new heart. I'm not going to look because then you make me laugh, brother. <laughs> so a new heart is better than a new coat. That's a blessing. That's something to be happy about. Now this isn't like Joel Osteen or T.D. Jakes or Clef O'Dollar or these guys you see on televangelism. It's a joke. It's a circus. And they pray. It's, it's really motivational type speaking, sales pitches. Um, some of it's good, right? And then they mix the Bible in it. Dude, just, just say you're a motivational speaker and don't say you're a pastor, right? But they focus the people on making money. And you're setting people up for heartache and for disbelief in the Lord because God never said you're going to be healthy or wealthy. Yes, you'll have health. Yes, you'll have wealth. But you know what? You're going to get sick and die one day. Yes, you'll have wealth at times, but you know what? Sometimes you're going to be broken. It may be your fault. It may be not your fault, but it may be God's will. we got to look at blessings more than material. It is better to have a new heart rather than a new coat. To feed on Christ is better than to have the best earthly food. Who taught us that? Now, if you're hungry, that's tough, right? But what's the most expensive restaurant I can think of? I've never been Morton's, maybe Steakhouse, you know, uh, and I shouldn't be talking about food right before lunch, right? But maybe steak with, with lobster, whatever you can imagine. Remember Jesus was hungry and, and Satan said, cause these stones to become bread. And the Lord said, man shall not eat Live by bread alone, but by every word of God. When you learn to feast on the word of God, you know, it's good to discipline yourself and read every day and read a, you know, a scripture and all that. And that's good. I think that's good because you're inputting into your spirit and eventually you're going to um, reap of the spirit. But sometimes it's good to just take the book of Ephesians. It takes like five, six minutes, ten maybe to read through, and you just, what I do, I read it out loud, and I'll try to read the whole thing, you know, or I'll take a book at a time and read the whole thing, because you get the context of what he's saying, and it's beautiful when you're open to hearing from the Lord, and God through his word begins to speak on you, or to you, not on you, to you. When I began to study, to, to teach you guys and, and read the book of the Ephesians, I got blessed big time. I, I, I'm open with you guys. You guys know me. And I'm not, you know, a liar and put myself up here and say, this is, you know, my life is perfect. It's not. I suddenly forgot who I was. 
you know, I'm just kind of going with the flow, and, and I, I use the excuse of what happened a little while ago, you know, as, as, as an excuse or justification. But when I began to read the book of Ephesians, I began to remember, you're my son. You're blessed. You're going to heaven. You're forgiven. I've called you. You're this, you're that, you're this. And, and man, you begin to change inwardly and be grateful and thankful to the Lord. And when you learn to feast on the Word of God, you're blessed. When God gives you a new heart, you're blessed. To feed on Christ is better than to have the best earthly food. To be an heir of God is better than being an heir of the greatest nobleman. And nobleman is a word for a very rich or wealthy land owner person. Now, I don't think we all have, anyone has rich uncles or whatever here, right? But more than all those earthly possessions, you're an heir to the kingdom of heaven. To have God for our appropriation is blessed. Infinitely more blessed than to own broad acres of land. God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. These are the rarest and richest and most enduring of all blessings. They are priceless in value. Now you're blessed. You're rich in the heavenly places. Remember there was a parable of a rich man and the Lord calls him a fool. For as he's going to bed in his heart, he says, man, I have so much stuff now. I don't even know what to do with it. I'm going to start a new project. Tomorrow I'll build bigger barns and, and, and grander and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll do this and I'll do that. And the Lord said, you fool. For tonight, your soul will be required of you. And he died. And he left all that material wealth, all those projects, all those earthly dreams here on earth and when he presented himself before the Lord, he was naked before him and with nothing. Those of you who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're blessed. Those who have given your time, your finances, your prayers, you know, your, your, your worry, that time with the Lord, it's not in vain. One day in heaven, you're already blessed, but you will see the reward that you have. It is more blessed to be rich in heaven than here on earth. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Nothing. He says, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There's nothing he can give. But how blessed is he who has nothing but has the Lord? That's a rich man. That's a rich woman. And it's not godly to be poor either. So, you know, we all should have something, but don't look to finances as your blessing. If we have no appreciation of spiritual blessings, then we live at the level of animals. Now, I don't know if animals are grateful. Maybe some of our dogs are pretty grateful, right? But usually they just eat and, all right, that was good. I'll do the next meal. They're animals. We're not animals. We're grateful. Have you eaten a meal? Have you fed your kids? Just anything. And you just begin to cry. And you begin to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for feeding me, Lord. Thank you for feeding my kids. We can take it for granted. And no one likes to lean the time where you have to be in that position where you're grateful. But you know what? Thank God for those times. Thank God. <laughs> You've been there. I know you have. I've been there. Eating and just like crying. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You're good. <laughs> you know? Or you see your kids eating. Thank you, Lord. They don't know, but thank you, Lord. You've been there. We've been there. Thank God. We're not like animals. You're blessed, guys. We're super blessed. Notice... We're almost done. We'll, we'll look at it a little bit. There's no way we're going to get through the whole chapter. Just as He chose us in 
Him. Our possession for every spiritual blessing is as certain as our being chosen by Him and chosen, he says, before the foundation of the world. We'll get into that next week because I want to develop this longer and I won't have time today, but you're not just blessed because you chose Him. You're blessed also. I don't fully comprehend or understand, but He chose you before the world even began. It blows my mind. He loves you. He thought of you, obviously, before He even created you. Before you were even conscious of Him being God and loving you, He already chose you. And the sad thing is, many people don't live to the potential that God has for them. Saul could have said, Thank you, Lord. You saved me. You forgave me. But now I'm going to go back to the temple and worship you there. But Saul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm yours. All of me. And Saul became the Apostle Paul. Who are you? Who does God want you to be? You know, whatever your name is, apostle so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, missionary so-and-so, worshiping so-and-so, um, encourager, um, you know, prayer warrior, whatever it is that God puts on your life to call you to do, then people will know you like that over time as you walk it out. Let's go ahead and stand and close in a word of prayer. Remember this morning, you are blessed tremendously. Maybe not monetary, some of you may be, but you have a new heart, better than a new coat. You love the Lord. He loves you. You're blessed tremendously. Father, we come before you this new year, Lord that you would remind us of who we are. That we would look to you, Father, for these spiritual, heavenly blessings, Father. And as we focus on them, that our lives would transform and that you would use our lives here on earth to bring honor and glory to your name, Father. Bless these, Lord. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. And we'll close with one last song, if that's okay. Communion. Oh, yes, communion. Everything I want
And we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and that you've done, Father. Let's go ahead and partake of the bread. And Father, thank you for your blood that washes all our filthy sins away, Lord. All the evil thoughts and actions, Father. You make us clean and holy and righteous in you, Father. We love you. Let's go ahead and partake.